chapter 17 um, from Eric Foner's book, Give Me Liberty, the AP version. Okay, um, so I think I figured out where I left off in the last video, and I'm way too bored of my own self to go back and listen to it. So, we are looking at the People's Party or the Populist Party, and um, to kind of look at how these people are handling their political well, it's not really political power and it's not really political clout because they don't have any yet, but it's a burgeoning political movement. That's what we'll call it. So um, these parties, this is kind of our last real push um, in the 1800s for political variation. I'll put it that way. Um, so... You know, we, we kind of start out with the conflict between, I'm sorry, we start out the 1800s with the conflict between um, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. We move through into Andrew Jackson and all of the um, politics that are, or I guess the, the spread of democracy to the common man under him. And now we have the, another movement here for common man representation. Um, they use language that, wait, wait, I think we already talked about that because I feel this is like very, very, yeah, this is familiar to me. Okay, so sorry, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, our platform. So in Omaha, at the Omaha Populist Convention in 1892, the Populist Party adopts a specific platform. It was written by a man named Ignatius Donnelly. And if that is not an amazing name, I don't know what is. He was a Republican congressman, um, a, radical re a radical Republican during Reconstruction. There we go. And um, in this document that you have been assigned to read, it speaks about the country as something that has been brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin by political corruption. And to be honest, he's not wrong. Um, we have all of the political corruption that takes place during Grant's administration and then during the administrations of all those other old white dudes that all look the same to me, and I get them all mixed up with each other. Um, it says... Also, in this document, the fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes, while their possessors despise the republic and to endanger liberty. So, it's um, this kind of rhetoric where the powerful, the titans of industry, um, your Rockefellers, your J.P. Morgans, they are taking advantage of workers they are having your workers work long hours for little pay in order to enrich themselves and not the workers this is i mean dare i say it but a restatement of communism of of marx's theories on um the evolution of society and the way power is held in the economy the platform also gives proposals on how democracy can be restored and how um, economic opportunity can develop. That's the bell. And oh my goodness, okay, so I am in this little office in the library recording this, and it sounds horrendous in here, just in case you were wondering. Um, okay, so the things that they propose, it's the direct election of U.S. senators, government control of the currency, a graduated income tax, a system of low-cost public financing to enable farmers to market their crops, and recognition of the rights of workers to have labor unions. They also want a public ownership of the railroads in order to allow farmers to more inexpensively ship their goods to market. Um, if you are at all interested in populism, and I'm going to 100% admit that it is not something that is what sparks my um, brain cows, to borrow an expression, um, 
I've never really been interested in populism, but if you are, I cannot recommend enough a book about the, um, I guess kind of the life and development of Laura Ingalls Wilder's career. If you don't know who she is, she's the one who wrote the Little House on the Prairie books modeled after her life moving from um, home site to home site with her parents. And now, I mean, granted, they are cleaned up quite a bit and they were published in the 50s. So, um, but this biography called Prairie Fires, it's really amazing and it talks about um, how she advocated for some of these very same things, but um, I don't think anyone would have ever seen her as a populist. And in fact, her daughter Rose ends up being a huge fan of Ayn Rand. So there's that. If we are looking at what your book terms the populist coalition, and I, I, I guess that's a fun word to say, um, the populists are playing the political game pretty well. They're trying to get both black and white small farmers to join together. But as we know, in the South, it's not going to work quite as easily as it will elsewhere. Um, we have racism, we have politics from the Civil War, and many white populists are the ones who own the farms that your black sharecroppers are laboring upon. Um, we had the Farmers Alliance, we talked about that in the last video, and the Southern branches did not allow black farmers to join. The, they start something called the Colored Farmers Alliance. Um, There, it's, I'm sorry, I got distracted, duh. So in the South, um, your white populace, their ideas aren't really that different than people who would not have identified themselves with the populist, would have not been like, hey, I'm a populist. Um, but they do see that they need to get, perhaps get rid of the, the uh, hegemony that the Democratic Party has on the South, because as we all know, as long as you have one party in charge, that one party gets to do whatever they want to, whether it's for the good of all or not. Some of our white populists pointed out the obvious and said that both your black and white farmers have similar problems. And if they unite, you can have a common goal. Um, for some political theorists, they will say that the Actually, no, we'll, we'll hold on to that. I'll put a pin in that thought. Um, many blacks do not want to leave the Republican Party for understandable reasons. This is the party of Lincoln. This is the party that helped uh, get them out of, get them as a people out of bondage. And yeah, so some of them are actually attracted to um, the Populist Party, a coalition of white populists and black Republicans win control in North Carolina in 1894. And they call, they, they term this time period a second reconstruction. And um, there's increased spending on public education. There's more um, black office holders. But throughout most of the South, our white Democrats um, fend off populist politicians by using the exact same tactics they had used since the 1870s and which they will continue to use all throughout. That's horrible. Time. They will use these kind of tactics throughout time where um, they try to show whites that you know, the black person, if they get any power, they're going to completely destroy everything about their way of life and the whole, oh, well, you know, you might be less than me, you poor white man, but you're certainly better than that poor black man. They also stuff ballot boxes. They intimidate your black voters. Like, it's just the same old, same old. So if we go, let me see, let me pull up this. There we go. Um, this shows where your populist parties actually are gaining some control. So Alabama is heavy in the South, and then obviously out here in farm country. 
Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah do not have the ability to vote in elections at the moment. Um, and our East Coast here, they don't care about populism. Some of this stuff. Oh, populists, one of the big things that they do is they endorse women's suffrage. And it's not necessarily for reasons of, you know, equality. It's more on reasons of voting strength. The same way that um, radical Republicans after the Civil War wanted to make sure that um, the formerly enslaved or those that um, are of African descent had the, like, had the right to vote. It's the same way that the populists are trying to get women the right to vote. So if you can get this one particular subset of society voting and they are sympathetic to you, then you have that much more of a voting block to um, get elected with. In 1892, the Populist Party runs a man named James Weaver, and he does receive more, he does receive more than one million votes. Um, the party carries five western states. It has 22 electoral votes. They elect three governors. They have 15 members of Congress. Um, I mean, like, this is really, this is a great showing for a third party. And I will go out on a limb here and say that this is not going to happen again. Well, you know, let me take that back because I just thought of an exception. So it, it's, it, but it's a big deal. This is a cartoon about, well, it's from Texas. Let me see if we can read this. It says, let us clasp hands across the bloody chasm. Horace Greeley anticipated the inevitable. The Farmers Alliance takes up his burden 20 years after he laid it down. So the blue and the gray, we have the South, we have the North, um, and it talks about how all of these fears are just going down in the gully and things are going to be great. If only it was that easy. Women's suffrage. This is from a Colorado newspaper. All right, so... Again, I'm going to reiterate that the Severe Depression starts in 1893, and this is the worst depression the country will see until the Great Depression later on. Um, it begins, you know, as with any kind of economic downturn, you have tensions mounting between labor and um, I'm going to call it capital, so the people who are in charge of the labor, for lack of a better way to put it. The... Capital brings in, um, or I guess they, they kind of lobby for the government to help them, and the government's going to do that because the government is full of people like them. Um, also, who are you going to want to protect? People with lots of money or people that don't have a lot of money? So, you know, it's it's not even necessarily that the government is corrupt or even though it was, but it's not necessarily as corrupt as it may seem on the surface. It's just that traditionalists tend to side with your people who are in power. And that's who we have with capital. Um, the way they couch these protests by workers or even strikes is that it is a threat to public safety or public order. Um, there are several instances of where the government steps in and they send the militia or they send um, a heavy governmental response to get rid of any kind of protests that are happening by your working people. In Idaho in 1892, martial laws declared um, state militia and federal troops go into a mine to break a strike in 94. The federal government uh, deploys soldiers to disperse a group called Coxey's Army. Um, it's a band of unemployed men in Ohio led by a guy named Jacob Coxey. Should have changed your name, but it makes us giggle. 
And it, these people are marching to Washington to try to get relief from this uh, horrible, horrible depression. Here is a picture of the Coxie Army. Let's see, who are we looking at here? That is a very small child. That seems dangerous. Um, I don't know why they would bring their brass instruments on a march to protest working conditions, but here we are. There's another child, and I don't know what that is, but it looks fascinating. Let's see what else. More children, all boys, because make sure those girls are in their homes and sewing. There's one little girl. Look, she's allowed to see and watch the boys. Good for her. And then there's a baby. And yeah, all right. This is a This is okay. Let's zoom back out before I go to the next slide. Oh, I moved it. Uh-huh. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to go back up here for a second. Um, so we have a man named Eugene Debs. He will show himself to be a very charismatic um, politician. He speaks in very plain terms. He eventually runs for president on the Socialist Party's ticket, um, but initially... He is involved in the Pullman strike. So Pullmans are um, railroad sleeping cars. And in 1894, these wages for these people who um, help maintain these cars are going to be reduced because, you know, Great Depression, whatever. There's something called the American Railway Union. They have 150,000 members. Um, and they're just railroad laborers all the way from, I don't know, I don't know what railroad laborers do. I guess people who like drive the train, um, I don't know. Um, but anyone who works within the railroad can join this union and they call a strike. So as we know, um, the economy is so closely tied to the railroad that now that our rails are not running at all, it makes everything freeze. Like it's nothing can happen. Um, at this time, we have President Grover Cleveland and his attorney general, who shocking, get ready to clutch your pearls. He, he is on the board of several railroad companies. Huh, that's funny because if the railroads aren't working, then while the strikers aren't getting paid, who else may not be getting paid? Mm. I wonder if that's a conflict of interest, but it's okay. It's the late 1800s. We don't care. Um, he gets a federal injunction, though, to order our striking workers to go back to work. So federal troops, U.S. Marshals, they go into railroad centers, and there are lots of violent um, interactions leaving about 34 people dead. And eventually Eugene and all of the union's leaders are jailed for contempt of court because they violate this order. That is of questionable legality in the first place, but I didn't say that. So um, in the case called, it's they refer to it as in re Debs, the Supreme Court says, yes, you're right. Um, there are in, you, injunctions to stop labor unions from striking are 100% legal. So, yeah. Thanks, court. Um, Debs ends up saying that a concentrated amount of economic power is aligned with the state and national governments. And so because now these people who were already powerful in the first place with their money and resources, since they are now associated with the government, um, the, the working man, the ordinary person is not going to have um, a guarantee of freedom in their lives. Okay, so... 
In 94, our populists are doubling their efforts to appeal to industrial workers. And in our state and congressional elections for that year, the depression that is worsening, more people are starting to abandon the Democratic Party and move populists. So um, the populist vote in rural areas goes up. But most workers do not vote for the populist party. Um, very few of the populist demands actually reflect workers' needs, especially in urban areas, um, because they're, if, if they are asking for higher agriculture prices, this is going to raise the food costs for your workers, no matter what happens here. Um, so this kind of call for increased money to farmers makes a lot of everyday laborers go, uh, what about me? Like if, if corn prices go up, then it's going to be a lot harder to feed my corn eating family. Um, the movement, hold on. I'm trying to read a note that I made in, and, and, and the movement's Protestant and revivalist. Oh, okay. I was reading like words out of order. And so nothing was making sense in my brain. So it's also got a very Protestant revival feel. Um, very, very, very similar to the way you would think of the Second Great Awakening, any of those revivals that they have. It's heavily, heavily influenced by that. The rhetoric, the um, posturing, the way they present what they're saying. So this is kind of alienating your Catholics because they're like, look, that's just, I don't get it. Like, why is that man sweating so much? Uh, and a lot of our immigrants are also there because, I mean, mainly a lot of them are Catholic. And they're like, I don't know about this. So our urban voters are voting Republican. And the Republican Party at the time says that higher tariffs are going to protect American manufacturing and protect our workers from cheap imports and cheap foreign labor. So mm, good luck with that, populists. But they, they did not quite do as well as they had hoped. Um, but again, in our rural areas, populists are doing well. Okay, so I kind of, I think I previewed William Jennings Bryan for you. God, I've talked about this man so much, I don't know who or where I've talked about him. So um, William Jennings Bryan was a congressman from Nebraska. He was younger than I am when he was doing all of this stuff. He won the Democratic nomination, and he was a very good public speaker. He was a revivalist Protestant. So he kind of grew up with this, that, that rhythm that is very common in um, evangelical Protestant churches. He runs on a position called free labor. I mean, not free labor, I'm sorry, free coinage of silver. And he wants to, he wants to mint silver money. He uses biblical imagery to condemn the gold standard and he has in his speech one of the most famous lines in American political history other than four score and seven years ago. Um, he wins the nomination by giving a speech called the Cross of Gold speech. I won't make you read the whole thing because you won't read it. And this quote's probably what you need to take from it. Um, this speech quote is, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. So as you can see there, it's got um, biblical imagery. It's got, I mean, I guess that's really all you need for people who are literal, biblical, like believers. They believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible and they're looking at this and they're saying, ah, oh, yes, I see, I see the issue here. So the problem is that a lot of currency, remember, it was taken out of circulation. And Brian and people who are like-minded believe that if we put silver in 
with our monetary sources, it will help out um, with the prices of our farmers' crops. It'll make it easier for them to pay debt because we're still, we're tied to the gold standard at this point in time. So Brian, as he gets nominated for the Democratic Party, because that's pretty smart on the Democrat side because they see this person who's pretty much a populist and go, hey, we're going to pull these populists back into the fold. It shows that we are taking the power, not we, but the Democratic Party is taking the power back from your elite smart people um, and putting it in the hands of someone who is seen as a God, I am not like I am not getting words today who is seen as the common man, if you will. Um, a lot of what he says is influenced by the social gospel movement. So, yeah. Republicans counteract Brian and they say that gold is the only honest currency. And if you abandon it, um, the economy is not going to cover, it's not going to recover because creditors are going to be scared away from making loans to people. Now, I am no economist, so I'm just going to leave it there. I'm not going to try to explicate anything about that. Sorry, I had to get a sip of Dr. Pepper. Okay. Repu oh, so we're talking about Republicans, Republicans. Okay. Governor William McKinley from Ohio. Doesn't he sound just as fun as everything? Um, he is over the McKinley Tariff, which was super, super protective, passed in 1890. In the 96 election, it's kind of seen as the first, quote unquote, modern political election. The Republicans put a ton of money into the campaign and they are trying to really educate voters against, or it's hard to say you're educating them against someone, but they're really educating them as to the possible outcomes if they do adopt this free silver platform. The country is divided politically along regional lines. McKinley wins the election because he gets industrial states from the Northeast and Midwest. It's great if you have the South as your voting block, but especially at this time period, that's not very many people. <laughs> it's, it's, you only have so many electoral votes. And when you're doing that electoral math, I, it doesn't matter. It just does not matter. Um, party politics kind of gets rid of our class conflict because in industrial America, all the way from your, like most, I don't know, the guy who sweeps the floors all the way up to Rockefeller, they vote Republican and they continue to vote Republican for very many years. McKinley, his, it says that his victory shatters the political stalemate of the previous 20 years, and it launches a period of Republican dominance that lasts until the 1930s. I don't know if anything that McKinley ever did in his life smashed anything or shattered anything because he once again falls under the, um, almost falls under the umbrella of old white dudes that I can't tell apart. But at this time period, we also have like the highest voter participation ever. And since 1896, it's been only down, 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 down. Isn't that fun? All right, let's look at the map. This is the map of the 1896 election. So as you can see, the electoral math is all here. Man, Ohio. But yeah, uh, so our electoral math, it just doesn't work for our Democratic um, or our populist candidates. There we go. Um, let me see if there's anything I need to say some more about the 
this election before I get into anything else. Um, oh, so McKinley's campaign to like make sure that we don't elect someone who's going to ruin our economy. They raised $10 million to spend and Brian's only a rate only raised around $300,000. So that's a lot of money. Um, Oh, here's a fun fact. So some people say that the wonderful wizard of Oz published by L Frank Baum is a commentary on the election of 1896. So the interpretation is that the Emerald City, everything is green, represents money in Washington, D.C. The Wizard of Oz, who is invisible in his palace and he rules by illusion, is President McKinley. And the only way to get rich is to go up a yellow brick road, which is the color of gold. Uh, the Wicked Witches of the East and the West represent industrialists and mine owners. And where is Dorothy from? Kansas, right in the farming heartland. In the book, like we know her as wearing ruby slippers, but in the book, she wears silver slippers. And those are the ones that are going to take her home, right? Click your heels together three times. So it's, if it's not, it sure is a real good fake. If that's not what it was meant for. Okay, um, here we go. Let's talk about, okay, so this is our Pullman Federal Troops. I've never understood why the troops don't join in to strikes, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. This is a political cartoon from the 1894 issue of Judge. And it is talking about our old friend, William. Look at William. Not the William we like, but William Jennings Bryan. And I don't want to say, like, he was a bad guy. He wasn't. He just um, was very much a man of his time. So this is the crown of thorns that he was like, you're not going to make us wear this. And this is the cross of gold. Um, can I read what those say? Bible. Bible, and I think they're making fun of him, quoting from the Bible all the time. Bible again. The sacrilegious candidate. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in. No man who... Oh, man, I can't read that. Let me see if I can find a bigger copy. No man who drags into the dust the most sacred symbols of the Christian world is fit to be president of the United States. So... Don't talk to me about Jesus, you hypocrite. What does that say? I can't tell. Hopefully you can because your eyes are much younger than mine. Combating the money power. Colorado populist cartoon shows liberty. Um, combating the power of money. Through what? Let's see. The producer. Money power. And our ballot box. The sovereign power is the ballot box. All right, so moving on to our second focus question. Let me check our time. Oh, man, I've been, like, babbling for a long time now. Um, let me see how much of this I can get to. I think I am. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it here, and pick up in another video that hopefully I will be able to make. <laughs>